Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to Cut the Shit, a podcast series that aims to take a closer look at the impact of the IT industry, both the good and the bad. Cut the Shit is brought to you by Plow Networks, a managed IT services company based just outside Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Brian Link, EVP of Products and Services here at Plow, and I'll be your host for this series. I'll ask questions, and with the help of our guests, try to dig deep on some of the key challenges we all face dealing with IT. So with that, let's cut the shit and get started. On today's episode, I am pleased to have Bill Harmer as our guest. It's no exaggeration to call Bill a security guru. Over the course of a 30-year career in IT, Bill has worked with and for everything from small startups to large enterprises and government entities. In his early days, he cut his teeth on scaling internet operations and fighting hackers in the late 90s, then moved into helping companies marry ISO and SAS 70 to create a trusted security and audit methodology for SAS companies. Since then, he has had a number of security-focused operating and advisory roles with lots of big names, Good Data, Zscaler, and SecureAuth, just to name a few. He has all the industry certs you would expect, and he has published widely on a variety of security issues. Bill recently joined Kraft Ventures as operating partner for security, where he helps portfolio companies weave sound security practices into the fabric of their growing companies. Bill and I have a wide-ranging conversation about the current state of security inside companies, what companies should be doing to be more secure, and what he sees as the biggest opportunities coming down the pike for both the good guys and bad. Enjoy. Bill, welcome to Cut the Shit. How are you doing today? Great, great. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thanks again uh, for joining us. So um, where are you today? You mentioned, um, I think, that you were in transition. So where are you today? Uh, I am in uh, the offices at Craft Ventures uh, in San Francisco. Um, I'm in the process of moving back from Austin, Texas to, to San Francisco. I'm doing the reverse commute. How long were you uh, in Austin? Uh, I was there for three years, uh, headed out there in 2019, uh, got there uh, with a plan. Uh, plan was to uh, have a home base and then travel internationally. I was traveling a ton for Zscaler back in those days. Uh, my wife was going to travel with me. We had all these great ideas. Uh, pandemic hit, and it was a great place to hide out for that as well. Um, but then, you know, plans changed and we decided let's come back to the West Coast. I got gotcha. you. I got you. Okay. Um, well, speaking of travel, have you been traveling much lately? Not really. No. Um, couple little things here and there. Uh, all, all, you know, U.S. based. Uh, so I think you know, I've been Dallas. I've been down to Houston a couple of times. Went over to Nashville once. Um, but no, um, the the move back to the office is starting to happen. People are starting to feel more comfortable just simply meeting in person. Um, but when you get things like vendors in the office, they're kind of like, uh, you know, I'd rather see my colleagues and coworkers and take the risk on that one. So they're making risk-based decisions and I think really good ones actually. Um, so I think it'll be a little bit longer before those, that, that big travel thing starts to happen again. And will with craft, will that lead you to more travel in terms of it? You mentioned international travel, uh, with Zscaler, is that going to be a part of the game going forward? Uh, not sure. Probably not. Uh, I, unless, you know, something pops up that they would need it. Um, a lot of what I do now is I'm doing advisory work for the portfolio companies. So when Kraft is either thinking about uh, investing, they might ask me to sit in on a meeting list and ask some questions about the tech that they're looking at. Um, or it could be a company they've already invested in. And now they're trying to make that next step into how do I set my security posture? How do I deal with privacy? Uh, how do I build, you know, a cloud ops team that can scale? Um, so I come in and, and talk to them about some of those things. That's perfect. Well, that, that'll that lead right into some of the conversation we're going to get to. So uh, put a pin in that because we'll definitely want to get there, um, I think, for sure. Um, before we jump in, tell us, what what do you think, I mean, when, you, when you've looked back over the last couple of years, what is the most interesting use of technology you've seen relative to the pandemic? You know, we went through this huge change kind of it wasn't overnight, but it was pretty close. So what, what's been the most interesting use of technology that you've seen during this period? Uh, interesting. That's a good one. Um, Cause like, you know, the most common was the web, this stuff, like the, 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 right. the web enabled meetings allowed the transition over. Um, and, you know, we had set ourselves with things like Netflix, Hulu streaming. Um, so we had a, a plethora of uh, home entertainment to keep us 
vaguely amused while we were at home. Um, you know, I think, I guess the most, I would say personally, the most interesting has been the push uh, or the dive back into YouTube. Um, I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of try it, fail, and then try it again until you get it right. Um, I am not the poster child for things like higher ed or going to school or book learning. Um, and I, I found YouTube so incredibly valuable uh, through the pandemic because I was teaching myself to weld aluminum. I was teaching myself um, different skills I needed to build custom bikes. Um, I actually have one uh, that is actually going to be shown at the Austin Handbuilt Show uh, April 8th to the 10th. Uh, in Austin, Texas. So, you know, my first full custom bike is going to be shown there. And I, I'm virtually, bicycle like I learned, or motorcycle? Oh, no, mo yeah, motorcycle. Yeah, motorcycle. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, full cu custom cafe racer. But I, I taught myself things like how to mold fiberglass, uh, how to pour uh, acrylic. You know, I, I blew one up, which was really funny. But uh, yeah, I, I would say that was the most, at least the most useful uh, thing that happened during the right. pandemic. Something was already there, but you really got re-engaged with it because of this big chunk of time. Yeah. And the inability to go anywhere else or, or yeah, go look over someone else's shoulder and that sort of thing. This was sort of what YouTube enabled. Exactly. Got it. Got it. Perfect. All right. Well, let's jump in and get to the kind of the main event. Um, to get us started, you, you mentioned craft. Uh, obviously, um, you know, from the intro, folks are going to know this is about security, but give us a little thumbnail sketch kind of on your background, how you got to sort of this world you're in today? Sure. Um, so uh, th this is technically my backup career. Um, <laughs> that's sort of been the amusing part about this whole journey. Um, my desire, like as every kid when they're growing up, was to do something cool. Uh, and I was headed into the world of special effects. Um, I wanted to do movie practical effects. Uh, my dad you know, he said, you know, that's great. I can't help you with that. I don't know anything about it. But what I can do is I can give you a way to earn some money until you can figure that out. And he got me a job working for Sony of Canada in their data center because he was a tech guy. You know, life happens seven years later. You're still working at Sony of Canada. And you're sort of thinking, uh, wow, I wonder what I'm going to do. And I had a manager back then. Uh, he questioned my desire to learn HTML because I had mentioned that I was I was writing hand coding HTML. This is this is ninety six, I think, late ninety six, early ninety seven. Um, and he said, "Why are you doing that? The internet's a fad. It'll be gone next year." And so I quit the next week. Like I, I my brain said, "Okay, I'm going to die here in my career. I need to move on." So I did, and you know, it was the craziest thing anybody ever said to me. But I thank him for saying it because I quit. I joined a, a startup company that did everything and anything. Um, and one of the things they did was uh, all of the backend systems for adult content back in the late 90s. It was the only way you could make money on the internet. And we got, we had machines were being hacked all the time. Um, and we watched, we watched this progression. It just became that natural progression of attack and defense. They would do something, so we would do something to fix it, or they would do something, so we would do something to defend against it. And it just evolved uh, until a gentleman by the name of Evan Krapko, who, um, he and his brothers started DocSpace back in the late 90s. Um, they, they were looking for somebody who could handle big pipes, networks, uh, and security. And somebody said, yeah, Bill does that over at this porn company. And you know, he went, that's, that's the kind of guy I want. I want somebody who can handle that kind of volume, that kind of stress, that kind of scalability, uh, and that kind of attack. Uh, and it just happened. I, you know, I moved through sort of the need uh, as it happens. You know, when I joined right. Success Factors, it became privacy. I need to focus on privacy. Um, when I joined uh, SecureAuth, they needed cloud operations. So I did that. You know, it's, it's just, I'm the guy that if something's broken, I'll fix it. If you need something built, call me. That's what I do. Gotcha. So sort of the perfect orientation or mentality for something that was basically brand new, the internet. And then of course, security problems came right on the heels of the internet, which was not built to be secure, right? I mean, that exactly. was the, by nature, it's an open protocol. So therefore, layering security on top was always a call to hack. That's maybe not fair, but it, it wasn't no, built to do that. Yeah, right? it, it, it is not. I think it's absolutely fair. It's, a, it's the best way to describe it because a hack is, is, you know, finding a way to make something do something it may not have been uh, originally designed to do. Right. Fair. Okay, I'll take it. I'll take it. All right. So you mentioned the early days um, and, you know, well, the early days, again, it's hard to believe for me that the early days were the late 90s, early 2000s. But that's what we're <laughs> that's where we are. That, this is what happens when you're 51. Um, 
Well, you, you described sort of a, a um, maybe a, a scenario or a recurring scenario. They would attack, we would respond. They would attack, we would respond. What were some of those? What were some of the challenges you guys were facing, and what were some of those attacks like that you were dealing with at that time? Um, so we were dealing with a lot of uh, back then. It was the script kitties, right? It, you know, it was just stuff running out there because none of the ISPs, none of the providers were even aware of what was really happening. So this stuff could be launched off your home network, and they could scan and compromise a machine in you know minutes. It was it was brilliant to watch. Like I I, I absolutely loved setting up a machine with a second logger uh, out to another machine and watching the logs and just watching it happen. You know, boom, rootkit. You're like. That's brilliant. Okay, now how do we stop that happening, right? Um, so it, it just really became um, uh, sort of, it was scale back then. It was large scale, simple attacks um, because, you know, fundamental protocol, f fundamental process didn't take into account things like, um, you know, stripping out unnecessary services. You know, you just grabbed Mandrake or, you know, Debian or something, you threw in BSA, whatever, you threw it in and you ran the operating system and you threw your web server on top of it and off you went. Um, and that's when we started learning, okay, you know, the reality is you don't need a web server running on this uh, thing or you don't need DNS running on everything. Have DNS only on your DNS services. So you started you started building out the 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 machine more specific to what is used, right? Um, and then you 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 gain things from that. You learned that it ran faster, it ran better, your images were smaller, you could recover quicker. Uh, like when we started really early days, we were running web servers off uh, uh, SGI machines because they were the only ones that could handle the volume. And like, I mean, those were expensive pieces of hardware versus your basic Intel running you know, uh, a Unix system. And so we, we spent a lot of time and effort trying to figure out how do we trim those down? How do we get the scalability right. up? Yeah. Cause it was, I mean, it was a CapEx business at that point, right? I mean, the oh, yeah. machines were, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on what your needs were. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you know, when you're talking bandwidth, same thing, right. You know, like the conversation we were having earlier, was super. Exactly. Not only was it, there was a reason it was super expensive, right? <laughs> yeah, my dual DS threes I think ran sixty, seventy thousand a month, um, and that's that's ninety megabits, right, for for seventy thousand a month. But you know, that's what you that's what you paid for for what you were doing, and it was the investment you had to do, and we made money on it. Right, right. Um, so fast forward for me. I mean, I, there's a, there's a lot there's a, there's a lot of ground to cover between the late nineties, early two thousands, and today. But in the last three to five years, you know, how have the how have the threats evolved? What what's different now versus maybe uh, you know go way back kind of to the old days? But even in the even in the interim, kind of into the late two thousands, early twenty tens, what's what, how have the threats evolved in terms of what are we seeing that looks different from uh, from the past? If anything, maybe it's not. Maybe it's a variation on themes. I was going to say the sad part is it's a variation on theme. Um, you know we. We saw this massive move into AWS, GCP, mostly AWS, but GCP and Azure, they are following up real quick. Um, and it is the same theme that's hitting AWS, right? It is the misconfiguration. It is the, by default, allowing too much. Um, if, if you go in and look at, uh, you know, an, AD, an AWS installation of a company, um, they may have sort of taken each individual piece and built it correctly. But when you put the pieces together and then somebody goes in and says, well, oh, pandemic hit, we need remote access. And it automatically turns on things like public IP addresses and stuff like that. You know, that that's how you just get destroyed. There was an entire, I think it was Montana, one of the states, same thing. They were doing all of their uh, testing in uh, AWS so they had set up a full Active Directory in AWS to do testing. That, that sounded brilliant, right? Let's keep it off the, the hardware that we run for the state. But the admin needed to do some testing. So he did remote access, gave it a public IP address. That got compromised. He used the same password there that he used in production for the AD account. Open a door to it. Exactly, right? So it's the same variation. It's the, it's the move fast, fail quick. The problem with that is the failures can be just astronomical. So, so it, it raises the question in my mind, when you think about that, even though it's a variation of the theme, with so much more activity now in the cloud and so many more people, basically, I'll, I'll say leveraging servers, whether they realize they are or not, yep. it doesn't matter, they are. Um, I guess it, it, it's only fair to say that 
it's easier to get compromised now than it was five or 10, 15 years ago, despite advances in security technology. Yeah. Um, like, I mean, if you look at sort of the progression of attack, right? Um, threat actors tended to not go after corporation directly because they had built a good stack in front of it. They defended it well, IDS, IPS, sandboxing, you know, firewalls, the whole bit. All of that is happening. So what they do is they went after the person at home because that's easy, right? You know, you got, you know, the defender. Exactly, right? And then just walk the threat back into the environment. Um, now we have things like the entire corporate infrastructure in a public infrastructure that be, by default must be accessible from anywhere in the world, right? So um, people don't go into AWS and the first thing they do is trim it all down and create a secure communication path in. What they do is they start firing up their, their services, their application, their database, whatever it is. And how, how many times do we see this thing where it's they found a database repository on AWS that was a backup of something and it was open to the world? Right. So it's we're making the same mistakes because we're moving so fast. We're not able to teach the security to everyone. And that's I think that sort of ties back into my theory. My my life goal is to get rid of the chief information security officer role, because at that point, it means everybody is doing security within the company. Right. So it, I don't know if it's attainable or not or whether it's just, you know, me saying shit. I, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, oh, no, no. Trust me. Well, this is this is this is not G rated. Okay, oh, so good. good. Um, so it's me just saying shit. Um, but th that's that's where that's where we need to get to. We need to build this stuff in from the beginning, and it's it's encouraging because as I see startups today, I I don't have to go in and say, "Oh, are you thinking about this?" They're like, "Hey, we're thinking about this, but we don't know what we're supposed to do." Right. So right. we've changed awareness the, uh, is, is the start. Like it's like AA, right? You know, the first thing is acknowledging you have a problem, right? It's, exactly. <laughs> yep. You got to start there. So, yep. Um. Well, I figure you've got lots of war stories and we could probably sit on this uh, podcast all day doing that. But could you tell us, can you give us a couple of instances or some some of the biggest compromises or some of the most interesting things you dealt with, uh, you know, in, in your career that, you know, might be instructive? Yeah, um, you know, if you're probably the, one of the big ones is, you know, taking over a new role somewhere um, and, you know, if you're dealing with a software manufacturer, uh, that that builds software and you go in as the head of security, your gut tells you go back over the history, right? Don't trust. Like uh, I, I, the whole concept of zero trust has to, has to, ex has to permeate everything uh, when it comes to this, this tech. So, um, you know, finding zero days uh, and finding ways to communicate to your customers that there's an O day in there that, you can't tell them anything about because you need to get the patch. Like having the phone call with another CISO saying, are you really asking me to put a patch into my production system and you're not going to tell me anything about it? I'm like, yeah, I need you to trust me on this one. And he's like, okay. <laughs> but, you know, those kinds of things, those are terrifying, but, but at least the community that comes together when I can have that conversation with a dozen different CISOs and they all go, okay, I'm going to trust you on this because you've developed that partnership with them. And I think that's sort of what we're seeing today in the world because of the whole SaaS model, everything going out there um, that, that you have to build that trust. Um, I've seen, I've seen machines compromised in minutes. Um, you know, it's brilliant to watch. Um, I've, I've watched, um, Oh, it, the, the whole concept of um, utilizing things like uh, AWS and, and the other cloud computing platforms um, for attack launches and watching the, the variations in how the threat actors take over the resources and use them. Because, you know, companies like AWS and that, they have to put controls and boundaries and pieces on it to a certain degree. But when you have a company that is wildly successful, they could look like a threat actor launching an attack at the same time because they expand quickly. They develop, you know, right. so how do you balance that? And, and watching that develop is really, really cool. Yeah. I mean, it, it's an interesting bill. I had a little bit of an audio issue. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just making sure. Um, it, it raises, it, it, I, I don't want to get too theoretical. Well, I'm not going to get theoretical at all. Maybe this is more meta. It's probably, but I, I can't get theoretical when it comes to security. Cause I don't, I don't know enough. Uh, I know enough to be dangerous and that's about it. And I approach this mostly, you know, kind of from a, a business person's perspective within the realm of technology, as opposed to, you know, a security person. And I, I certainly agree with your, uh, you know, 
I love the sort of the mission of getting rid of the, rid of the CISO and having it be really distributed and kind of inherent to the function of of the organization, right? Realistically, because yep. you said something early on about um, you know previous you know original threats, kind of old school or OG threats to to new threats being a variation on a theme, and the the thread running through that really felt like human error. <laughs> it would be the way I would you know whether it's a whether it's a um, an actual error, meaning I I, I missed misconfigured something or coded something wrong um that's that's one one flavor but the other is um you know uh, errors of omission just not preparing or thinking about things uh, on the front end so as you think about that that feels like a misconception when it comes to cybersecurity because my my perception of it if, certainly from consuming media or listening to people talk about it is that this feels like voodoo right and that all the stories about the stories about cybersecurity compromises and attacks are always they're, it's shadowy and nefarious, but it's also some really smart Russians or Chinese people who figured out how to hack amazingly, you know, uh, well-designed, um, incredibly, you know, sort of like some James Bond kinds of stuff, right? And what I'm hearing from you and what I see in our day-to-day -day is something quite different than that, that it feels a little more Keystone Cops than um, you know, uh, MI, MI6, MI5. I, I, I'm curious to get your take on that. Am I, am I, yeah. am I on point with that? Yeah, uh, you, I think you definitely are. Like there, there are definitely the super smart people out there working the very incredible hacks that you hear about. Um, so when you think about the whole cyber threat um, process, it's they're, they're, it's it's about the goal, right? The the days of hackers that do it for street cred that seems to be completely gone. Um, you you still see them at DEF CON, right? And that's where it should be, and and that's where they've proved their skill, and I, I, that's why I love hearing about it. But so you're either doing it for the money, or you're doing it for the ideology, right? Those are the two big buckets. For Fair. the money, right? That's your your ransomware, um, for instance, right. and that is very simple, right? If we stop paying ransomware it stops because there's no money to be made, right? But people can't, they, they invest, they, they have their, uh, their photos from history, their, their family, they have the tax dollar, whatever it is, there's, there's a reason they want something back. And some will, will, will be willing to pay for it and they'll always try it. Once, once we stop paying, it goes away. Um, and then there's the other side, the, you know, the, um, in, the state-sponsored industrial, the, the ones where, um, not industrial, but more like state-sponsored political, the ideological. Right. That doesn't matter about money. The the North Koreans or the Russians, they will invest money. They will spend money like there's they're doing right today in the Ukraine. They're spending money to send people to drop bombs to do like that all costs money um, to accomplish a different ideology, right? So those are the the, the 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 secret hacks where they will put so much money finding out a way to simply tweak a USB so that it works with this one particular case, there's no scalability in it. Um, on the other side where it's money, it's all, I think your standard marketing, right? If you do product development um, and think about product development, product marketing and sales and, you know, the mark, that is exactly what the threat actors are doing. They're running through the same plan, but they just tend to spray it everywhere and look for the place where they can get it. Um, so that's why it's, I think that's why it separates the two. And I, I, I have not been closely aligned or uh, touched on that state sponsored side of things. The businesses I've been in don't tend to attract that attention. Right. Um, and I'm Ours probably either. thankful for it. Yeah, yeah me that's too. just a, yeah, that's a whole thing. lot. The guys that's that a tougher, tougher problem to deal with. Right. For it sure. is. The guys that the guys and girls that defend against that are super smart. Um, I love talking to them uh, because of the way they think. Um, Unfortunately, I just tend to think like a common criminal, not like an espionage criminal. So I work over right. on this side. Yeah, I get you. And so within that, what I raised the issue of common mis misperceptions, but then or misconceptions, but then moved into this sort of human element. What what are some common misconceptions from your perspective and based on your experience? Again, now we're uh, talking garden mean, variety commercial folks, mostly around the the bad actors who are they're looking for money. Right. This is this, this is what we're dealing with at this point. So when you say misconceptions, are you asking uh, like uh, are, are you asking the mistakes that we tend to make that allow this to happen? Yeah, we can. Okay. Yeah, let's start there. Yeah. And because those are yeah. going to stem from these misconceptions, most likely. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, it's it, it it it's that it's that balance between here's something 
um, that you can use. And I want to make that thing that, that you use uh, hit as many people as possible. So that's, you know, your AWS installation. That is your installation on a server of Windows, whatever. Um, versus I have a specific need, but I don't know how to take it from here to there. So what happens is um, people come in, they've got a brilliant idea, they're idea people or they're business people, and they say, we want to do this thing. Okay, well, let's set up some stuff to do that thing, right? And they're thinking about that thing. They're not thinking about how will that thing be abused? Most people don't think like criminals. Um, my mother, God lover, um, always wondered which side of the this equation I would end up on. Um, and, you know, Frank W. So you were ideally you know, suited, in other words. Oh, <laughs> Yes. Yeah. My, it, it, it makes my son cringe. It makes my wife worry. Um, and I, I've, I've got a picture, side story. I've got a picture of myself with Frank W. Avignale, uh, the guy who wrote Catch Me If You Can, um, yeah. because his book, when I read it and what happened to him made me go, ah, I probably shouldn't be doing some of this stuff, right? Uh, I, <laughs> maybe I should be on the other side of this thing. Um, There's it, a line and I might have crossed it. <laughs> yes, it, it dramatically changed my life because I, I saw the the fun, the excitement, the thrill of the side. But then there was the, you know, his time in a French prison. And if you read the book, it's it's dramatically different than than the movie. Um, and, and the threat of having to go to an Italian prison, you know, I mean, all of that just scared the crap out of me. So, um, you know, it's 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 um, most people don't think that way. They don't think like criminals. So when they build something and they say, hey, I'm going to build this application, they think about all the good it can do and the way they want it to be used and the way it's going to be used. And it takes people to look at it and go, how can I get around it? Or how can I, how can I steal something from it? How can I use it for something it shouldn't be? And that's the piece that's missing. I think surprisingly, it's going to be things like AI. Um, and this might get a little frightening. If you could build sort of that artificial intelligence that can think about uh, permutations, combinations, ways of, of utilizing things, you can create more secure systems. If you can create an AI that thinks like a criminal, now this, <laughs> this is where Skynet shows up somewhere, but yeah. if you can get it to think that way, how can you abuse it? How can you take a concept and let me think about all the other things I can do with it that it was not designed for? You can start finding ways to cut off the access and, and stop the abuse earlier. Um, yeah, it's and almost I think like that... Uh, it's almost like that back and forth you described the uh, attack and response. Yep. You could almost model that out. Is, is sort of yeah, what you're you think describing. The whopper, yeah, think the Whopper from War Games, right? It, you know, it runs through its scenarios till there's a no right. win. That's what we need. We need it to do. We need it to be able to say, how many times can I do this to the point where it doesn't make financial sense for me or whatever my motivation that you give it is. I, I can't make money out of it. I'm going to leave that alone and move away. If you simplify it, to, I'm a motorcycle rider been that for 30 years and we've all I've always gone by the principle of if somebody wants to steal my bike they will right because it's right. it's it's 400 pounds best case scenario they pick it up and throw it in the back of a van and they're gone um but what I need to do is make my bike harder to steal than the one beside it right and then if you make all the bikes too hard to steal they'll go somewhere else and if then all the bikes that they keep finding are too hard to steal they'll just find something else to steal right, right. and that's sort of where we've gotten to got it okay so Let's let's transition a little bit to some specifics. So you know you're you're at you're you're working at Craft, um, which I, I did a just a a smidge of, of research. So early stage funding, right? Growth funding. Um, yep. So these are not one man in a, a garage. It doesn't sound like, but you're there's an early stage company. So you know it, it, for for the guys and gals that are starting these companies and they're in these early stages, what's the if you had to boil it down, what are what are the one What's the one security thing they can't afford to miss? And then maybe beyond that, what are the next two to three? So, you know, one to three to four sort of critical things um, to do's around security as it relates to, uh, you know, a, a, an earlier stage company. So I, I'm using early stage really as a proxy for we don't have a lot of legacy stuff. We don't have a lot of we don't have a lot of infrastructure. We're, we're on the front end. We, we get to sort of decide what we're going to do on the front end. But then there's also go alongs that you probably need to be doing no matter what your infrastructure looks like. Yeah. Um, right now, I, I definitely uh, go down the, uh, the um, sort of segregation of duties, the, um, the user accounts and how you're provisioning access. Um, 
we have seen things build out and like you said when you're when you're a startup now there's no legacy hardware you're jumping probably onto aws gcp or azure one of the three right um and you're building out from there so it's about identity um, it's about how are you identifying not only the people that do the jobs but also your customers and how are you planning that out to manage the identities of them um, in a secure manner just so much of what happens today is phishing, it, it's social engineering, and it's ways to compromise a user's identity to do something else. So um, if you're building a, a financial reporting tool or you're building a health app um, or you're building you know, a new game, every one of those is going to require identities to build it and manage it and identities to consume and use it. So how are you managing that out? So I, I sort of work down that path um, to give them the concept because they've all thought yeah. about it. That's the good part. They're all thinking about my user count, how many seats am I selling? How am I managing? Right. The back end tends to be a little bit thinner where they say, oh, well, you know, Bob in engineering, he does engineering, he does testing, he does security because we've got one guy to do everything. It's like, okay, let's make Bob's life a little more complex. Give him six identities, digital identities that he has to log into to consciously think about what he's doing because when one of them gets popped, you're not spreading it across, right? So we're, I see. Okay. we're trying to at least guide them to, to, to the understanding the money is there to invest, and they're being very conscious. And this is the fundamental problem with security and startups. There is no point putting money into security if you don't have a product to sell, right? So why do I build security into it at start? What I hopefully guide them to is build the base that you can work off of, and then you can add the security later when you have a viable product and it's it's sellable and you have revenue to generate. Um, but don't have to rewrite, right? You don't want to build something and then you go, hey, it's wildly successful. Oh, hang on, I got to pause, do a better whole get security version. now. Exactly, yeah. right? So so think about how to build the hooks in at the beginning. You may not execute on them, you may not uh, pay for them, you may not really use them, but they're there and ready for when you become wildly successful. So, uh, you know, sort of segregation of duties within the concept of identity um, as it relates to sort of a, a sort of fundamental building block of yeah, security posture really out of the gate, and that that scales exactly. down to you know a, a three man shop really at that point. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's helpful. Um, this is kind of a specific question, um, and and we're going to fast forward to now a, an ongoing entity that's you know it's got revenue, it's got it's got some systems in place, and they're yeah you know, they're trying to figure out how do I how do I maintain a security posture that conforms to some sort of standard, right? Um, right. Either because their insurance company is asking them to do it or they've got a regulatory agency they're dealing with or auditors or their board or whatever. And, you know, we, you know, companies are often told, you know, security people are the, I won't say they're the worst, that's not fair, about this <laughs> particular thing, uh, you know, about using jargon and uh, acronyms and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, they hear a lot about, you know, we, we, you ought to look at the CIS framework or a NIST framework you know, or, or we use either of those in the in the process of what we do. And and can you give a quick overview of those sort of what are they supposed what are they and what are they supposed to do? I, I, I sort of know the answer, but our audience, I'd like for them to hear that from you. Yeah. So frameworks are designed to give you a set of controls, right? Um, it's, it's to give you the plan to execute on something. Um, if you go back, take the whole process into a SOC 2, right? That started with SAS 70. SAS 70 was a framework. It was an auditing framework. It was simply, right. here are the rules and processes to audit something. There was no content in it, right? So when I was doing this early days, I was taking the ISO standards and putting them into the, the SAS 70, and I was taking out the pieces that I felt were not necessary. Because when you look at something like ISO, ISO is, is rigid, um, and there's nothing wrong with rigidity. Sometimes rigidity is really good. Sometimes you need a little flexibility. Um, and if you're building a plane or making a drug, I want as much rigidity in your process as possible because if you put one wrong rivet in, that plane the tolerances down. aren't there. Correct. Exactly. Correct. Right. Tight tolerances. But when you build software for HR management, you got some loose tolerances there. I don't need to have meeting minutes from my meeting. I just have to say that I have met with and here's X, right? So that's what we do. We trimmed out all of what we thought was unnecessary cost overhead in, in, in say, ISO, put it into the SAS 70 and created this audit framework that ended up being 300 pages. And what we saw was the abuse because other people would just simply put in the light stuff that meant nothing, create a SAS 70 audit, go, hey, I've got my SAS 70. Out from that came the SOC 2 where it said, here are the controls. Um, and those control frameworks 
whether you pick uh, NIST, whether you pick CIS, whether you pick ISO, whether you pick um, whatever it is that you want, you want it to apply to your business, right? And you're going to either be looking at your customer target audience that says, I want you to have NIST because I'm a government contractor, blah, blah, blah. Um, or you're going to go something a little more, more uh, broad. And you're going to say, I want to have, I hate saying GDPR compliant because GDPR is a law. And the only way you're compliant is you're not in jail. But right. for the sake of the conversation, you know, I want GDPR compliance. So what you're saying is I want privacy and I want appropriate management of personal data um, that does not involve me ending up in court as a customer of yours. Right. Um, so what you do is you put those into your framework and that's your ISMS, right? Your information security management system is going to set out the controls and policies and procedures, of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Very simplistic thing, but my uh, one of my old auditors and he was a fantastic guy at doing this. He said, it's really simple. You do what you say, that's what you write down in your in your policies and procedures. You say what you do, and that's what you do every day, and then you prove it, and that's your audit, right? And if you can right. tie it down to those three things, and that's what those frameworks are for. You pick the framework that works for your business, that is against your target audience, or maybe legislated, right? So if you're uh, if, if you're working in in some uh, some particular area, European data privacy, you're going to have to have compliance with something like GDPR. Yeah, or California right now with theirs because yeah, they've yeah. got it's not as stringent as GDPR, but let's face it, it's it's not a it wasn't a surprise where it well, came from, right? It's, no, and you know, and this is the interesting part when you start looking at these data privacy laws because there's a, another half dozen of them at least on the books from states. Um, it's it's. Interesting because politics brings in the this I'm better than you aspect, not what's good for the people. Um, and if you start looking at it, you start seeing, hey, this is GDPR, but we're going to do it better, meaning we're going to do it more stringent, more str right. right? And that stronger or more isn't always better. Sometimes, you know, there you have to find the balance between the, the security and the usability of it. Um, part of the problem that they had in Europe, the whole my belief and, and you know take it for what it is gdpr came around not because there was a need for it by the people it was a need for it by the businesses because you had 27 member states in the eu all interpreting the eu privacy directive their own way if you go to yeah right. go to germany every every uh whatever they do province uh, i'm not sure what they have in germany but every locale interpreted it differently and companies were just going i can't do this i have achieved german compliance and the italians said yeah but we do it differently and the French did it differently, right? CNIL was different. So it became this, uh, I can't, as a business, make it's money a, here. It's because untenable. I, right, yeah. Exactly. So they said, look, one set of laws out of Brussels, GDPR, boom, done. Same thing's going to happen in the U.S. Each of these states, CCPA, and then you're going to have uh, uh, Massachusetts, and then you've got, you know, uh, I think Illinois. They're all coming up with their own versions. It's going to go federal. It'll be a federal data privacy law. It'll say, here's how it works, and it works as an overarching federal privacy law, kind of like they did in Canada with uh, PIPITA. Yeah, I mean, federalism is a great concept that doesn't work very well on the internet. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a uh, it's really difficult to make it to make it work, right? I mean, and that's that, that's exactly what you're. You know, this is one of those. This is one of those classic examples. Exactly, because and yeah. this is going to get. That's actually going to, I think, start to go further when you start to see the convergence of things like Meta, like the metaverse. Um, you take that, you take current purchasing, right? You can buy something in Germany, they throw it in the mail, it shows up, no local state tax paid, right? Things like that are starting to break down. Add to that that people don't really trust government <laughs> anymore, right? People, you know, there's all these questions about the trust of government. When you start to bring all of that together, it starts to create how do you manage this global process, right? How do you, and we're, we're starting to see some of the effects that are happening when you look at what's happening in Ukraine, because Visa, MasterCard cut off all cards in Russia, right? So they can't be used. You can't use your current, if I go to Russia today, my card will not work in Russia. So they, they're able to do that from a financial, but somebody challenged Musk and said, why don't you turn off all the Teslas in, in Russia? And it's like, okay, wait a minute. Technically, I think he could. I don't know if you can do over the air shutdowns, but you can do over the air updates. So you could tank the update to the russian ones right you could you could crack the update yeah for sure exactly so so are we getting to that point is our geopolitical borders simply disappearing and now being taken over by the economic you know financial the 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 business side which is like if you ever read snow crash uh snow crash that you know that's what it was it was a dystopian future world that was ruined by economy 
and here we are, you know, it's starting to happen. Yeah. And this is, I mean, if you think back, right, I mean, uh, I'm a, a little bit of a nerd on history, right? You go back to pre-colonial days or early colonial days, right, where, you know, companies like the East India Company became pseudo governments, right? Yep. Or, you know, you look at what happened around the opium wars and what was happening in China, right? Those were, now they were state sanctioned, but it would be hard to argue that in the case of Elon Musk acting in this particular case, it would still be state sanctioned because if the, if the U.S. government didn't want him to do that, they could make sure. I mean, they still have guns, and they have yep. you know, there's 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 still uh, there's still le- there's still leverage there uh, that doesn't exist in the private sector anywhere. Having said that, private government is a real thing, right? I mean, I don't know if you live anywhere that's ever had an HOA or a condo association, right? But that is a private government. It may yep. not be as functional or maybe it's even more functional to to its detriment but it may not have the same leverage but like these are all over the place now and so it, that maybe what we're seeing is even it's just a proliferation of it because of the interconnectedness uh, of what we're seeing we, we we're getting a little far afield but this is fun stuff so two things i did want to ask about before we wrap and they're, they're yeah. specific one is around cybersecurity insurance and the other is around security awareness training and and sort of the the front line piece so from your perspective, as you think about cybersecurity insurance, fairly new product, right? Twenty years old, something like that. Not much, not much older than that. Um, how do you sort of think about cyber cybersecurity insurance in the context of a broader posture? Forget about whether it's good or bad or priced right. I, I, we're not. That's not what we're about. But the concept of it. Yeah. No, the concept I think is is appropriate, right? You've got to security is about the layers. It's about the defense in depth. Um, and so if you even think of the, the simple crypto issue, um, if you end up having to pay, did you do the right things up front? And then what's your fallback plan as a business, right? So you have to have those layers. So I think, it, I think it's appropriate, right? We have health insurance. We have um, business insurance. We insure our board of directors against lawsuits so that they can operate and do things and make mistakes or potentially go down the wrong thing, maybe out of earnest and doing doing all the right things, but something bad eventually happens because the world is imperfect. It will break and insurance is there to catch and minimize the damage. So I, I, I don't see a problem with it. I think you're right. You know, they've got to find ways to price it. The underwriting has to uh, be more, I think, um, uh, developed. I think it's still in its infancy and in how they figure it out because we've seen these wild swings in prices. It used to be like you, 50 cents added to your policy got you a cyber policy. Now it's wickedly expensive, right? Yeah. I mean, the, you know, uh, insurance always is a transfer of risk, but that assumes realistically that the uh, assumer of that risk, i.e. the insurance company, understands it and can price it appropriately, right? And it's yeah. become clear, particularly in the last couple of years, that that hasn't been the case. I mean, you know, when I was an accidental CIO back in 2013, 2014, we bought cybersecurity insurance. It wasn't very expensive. And and there was a feeling, you know, maybe this is cavalier or wrong, but there was a feeling that like, well, if you've got cyber insurance, cybersecurity insurance, you don't have to worry about much because if something happens, this was, you know, ransomware was still kind of new. Like it wasn't, yeah. um, it, it was more at that point, you know, and this maybe to me is maybe Again, I don't want to pontificate, but as I think about the biggest transition I've seen, most of what was what I thought of as security or cybersecurity issues were outside in. They were about people penetrating your network and getting in, right? Mm-hmm. And now it feels like so much of the issue is around inside out, compromising credentials, social engineering, and then getting in to where you could you know, lock stuff down and hold people hostage, right? That to me is it feels like the biggest at least the biggest financial risk for most, you know, for the garden variety commercial venture operating right. today. Um, I don't know if, uh, you know, I don't know if the insurance carriers, I mean, they'll figure it out because these guys are good at what they do. Right. But I think we're, we're in the midst of an evolution there that that game is getting, is, is changing before our very eyes. I mean, we, we've had multiple clients in the past three months who called us in a panic and said, look, our, our uh, our carrier just told us we've got 30 days to get uh, MFA installed across the organization and tested, yep. or they're not going to renew us. And they've given them yep. 30 days. You know, and yep. it's like they're like, "What do we do?" And we're like, "Well, I guess we're going to have to get to work because that's that's not going to be easy, but it can be done. But you've got to work." And so I, it's an interesting. It's it felt like a pure transfer of risk that now is what you described, which is if all else fails, there'll be somebody that we can go to to help us if we didn't do. If we miss something, you know, sort of a yeah. A, if it gets a, to, an honest error, you know? yeah. If it gets to the, and it should get to that point. Right now, it's in a lot of the oh shit moments, right, where the 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 insurance company looks at what they've underwritten and gone oh shit, uh, right. 
And then right. they don't they want back. to rewrite. I mean, they're, many of these feel like they're trying to get them to cancel because uh, give them give them a reason to cancel without them just saying, no, we're not rewriting you. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's about speed of change. Right. So as we get out of sort of the legacy, as we get to the point where we can move faster, you know, where you can put in MFA, not in 30 days, but in maybe a weekend, which you could do. And then I have actually seen it done once. Um, because it was exactly that. It was an insurance carrier that came in and said, you're going to be, it wasn't, sorry, it was not insurance. It was a regulator came in and said, you will not be doing business on Monday if you do not have MFA. Um, we were serious about it and they went, oh shit. And, you know, the call was made, MFA was rolled out over the weekend. Brutally, um, the user experience was awful. Yeah, but you'll, break, you'll, they, you'll yeah. make people very upset in their usage, yeah. but they didn't have a choice in that case. Yeah, right? exactly. That's, and that's, and that's, the that's where... Yeah businesses have to learn. They have to make sure that they understand security is a pure balance between protection and usability. Because if they can't, if a user can't use it, they will find a way around it, right? And if you do not accept that, you are dead in the water. Yeah, I think that's a fair a fair point. And, and it, that one's going to be interesting to watch. And we're seeing a lot of activity around that within our space, right? Which is helping people figure out how to, we're not a security consulting company, but we think of security within the context of the technology services we provided. So bottom line is you're there. I, I think I think ultimately it's where it needs to end up anyway. It doesn't need to be, well, let's call in security guys and they'll fix everything and then go away and we're all good. Yeah. Like that's it's not, it's kind of back to your, you know, uh, a world without a CISO uh, concept. But um, yeah, last question around on this front, you know, end user awareness training and sort of services around uh, anti-phishing and things like that. How are you got how are you seeing those services? What's what's the effectiveness like? And do you have recommendations or thoughts to to, to businesses who are, are considering those services or being advised to have those services? What what should they expect? Um I, I would think it's a tough one because um I I'm in the crowd that hates them. I hate doing the training. Um, Everybody and hates it. That's that. <laughs> right out of the, well, right out of the gate. I think the training needs to switch. It needs to it needs to determine context right does this person need the training and if they don't how do we give them a pass because you're not asked as you step out of your house every day wait a minute do you know the laws uh you know you're you, you're we assume common sense and then penalty for uh for for not uh, abiding by it so if you jaywalk it's a risk yeah you know i haven't seen a cop pick up somebody for jaywalking unless they need another reason to do it but you're not going to go rob a bank either because you know that, that is completely wrong right so I think the, that that's the awareness piece, right? We're sort of old west right now where the snake oil salesmen are rolling through town. People still think that, you know, you need leeches to get fixed. We have to start to dispel some of the myths. We have to find out, do people understand what we're trying to do? And I think if we get into that kind of training um, or that kind of teaching, maybe teaching is a better way to do it than training because training is very uh, – I think brings a, a, a certain mindset. We're just trying to teach people how to be safe in their world, in their new digital world, because that's where they're going. I think that's the more effective style. It needs to be done. It absolutely needs to be done. Um, and I have been seeing some uh, organizations sort of going down that route of test then train, right? Test then teach. Right. Uh, let me ask you yeah. some questions. And and it shouldn't be here's your forty five minute hour thing every quarter. You know, it can be very casual as you're going through your daily exercises and it should be um, not too intrusive, but where it, it tests, perfect example, a um, company called Oak9, they do sort of that teaching to engineers in the development process. So as a guy's coding, he or she maybe um, likes to use concatenated SQL statements, good horrific thing to do. Don't ever do it. But they like to do it, whatever. Um, and right then, as they try to check in, and it goes, no, we've seen this. You don't want to do that. Here's why. Here's a potential other solution to do it. They go, oh, okay. Right. And that's a teaching moment, right? That's a teaching moment where the person, okay. And then they go to do it again because muscle memory and brain memory does it. And they go, oh, wait, I got that warning last time. Let me fix it. Right. That's what we need to do, do to different. people. Right. right. Change of behavior. Right. Yep. That's that's useful, and I think I think we are seeing some of that evolution um, on the end user training, teaching, learning side, right? In terms of embedding yep. it in the experience itself, right, and and putting things in front of them that are potentially issues, and seeing how they react, and then based on their reaction, having them do either remediation or intervention at the point that says, "Oh, here's the here's what that was, here's why it's a problem," you know, that sort of exactly, thing. exactly. Um, and that you know, if you if you flip that around and say, "What's 
in my opinion, one of the worst examples that we're seeing, it's this continued, let's make passwords harder, right? All we do is make them harder, more complex. We can't think of them. We force people back into bad behavior because we've overcompensated on that side. We need to simply get rid of the passwords. We need to get to where, you know, your phone, your computer. Well, I mean, yeah, the biometric is the best thing that's ever happened, right? The touch ID yeah. and face ID. Right. I mean, if you were to ask people like the thought of having to go back, I mean, when you have to enter a password on your phone now, I don't know about you, but it just kind of pisses you off. Right. It's like, oh, really? Absolutely. Like, I mean, absolutely. yeah, you just and I've got LastPass and that sometimes with apps I have to go over it. I have to go open the LastPass app, copy the password, copy and paste. paste it in. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, you're just like, how did, how, you know, you, you, the, you quickly get tired of that, you know, in yes. a hurry. Yeah, and the, but the complete misconception that when I use Face ID or uh, fingerprints, that somebody has my fingerprint somewhere. It's still a belief that, that they're transmitting your actual picture of your face and your fingerprint to Apple, right? And, and we've got to get people educated on that part of it, not educated on how to make a better password. You know, science fiction has done great things for us in, in visualizing what could be, but it also has, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's allowed us to also to let our minds maybe wander a little too far yep. um, in, in terms of what's, you know, and, you know, look, if you're a conspiracy theorist or you're or you're you're distrustful by nature, then sometimes things are just hard to overcome. But, yeah, that we also tend to think, I mean, there are smart, smart people out there, but certain things just don't make any sense. Right. And that's exactly. That's yep. Right? Yep. <laughs> but, it, you know, it's hard to convince, you know, my you know, I, if I'm you know, I've got a you know, everybody's got a, you know, a crackpot uncle or or, you know, that you're never going to explain. You know, there's there, there, there are things they believe that they're just going to believe. Yep. And, and don't don't bother trying to don't don't bother with the facts. So, all right, last question before we get to a few little personal things. Um, you know, just kind of to sum it up, when you think about the current state of cybersecurity and you look to the future, are you optimistic or pessimistic about kind of where we're going and 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 why in either direction? I, I'm optimistic, um, and I'm optimistic because um, when I talk to younger generations, I hear things. Um, to them that are natural, that to older generations, I've had to push and fight with um, on the security side. Um, as I talk to startups, like I said, they're coming to me with, how do I do this? Not, hey, what am I supposed to do, right? They, they know. Or why should I do this, right? Exactly, yeah. they, they've got the concept, they, they know they, they may not be specific, but they're already asking, I know this is a problem, how do I make sure I don't get you know caught in that, that problem? So that's why I'm optimistic about it. Well, that's a good note to, to end on. So again, I always like to wrap up a little bit of personal personal things. So I know you're crazy busy having your your sounds like you're living in in two spots right now, but not for long. So in 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 transit for sure. But you know, in your downtime, have you have you watched anything or read anything lately that you think um, you know that was good enough that you think you'd want to recommend it to somebody else? Uh, Adam Savage's, uh, every tool is a hammer. Um, that book, I am halfway through it and I, I keep reading, like I, I, I keep reading passages that are, oh my God, this is just, this is me. This is, this is, we're coming out of, I think an age, I don't want to say an age of enlightenment, but we're starting to really truly understand how people think and work and live and learn. Um, and not everybody learns the same. Like I have always been that kid in school that did not do well unless I was told, you know, you're going to fail out, you have to do well. So I'd go do well. Um, I drove people nuts because I didn't need to study, do homework. I could pull a B average or a B plus average if I wanted it. Um, but I don't like doing that stuff. So his book is teaching the recognition signals of how to learn, like how to go out and learn stuff by doing, right? And that, that to me is, a, it's a fantastic book. So if anybody's out there thinking, hey, my kid has ADHD, yeah, we probably all do. And if you gave me like a, a spectrum test, you'd probably find me somewhere in some spectrum where I've got a problem. That's not the issue. You can find ways to teach people different things, right? It's not one way to teach them all. So I love that book. Adam Savage's "Every Tool Is a Hammer." We'll put it in the show notes to uh, to make sure everyone's got a got it uh, easily accessible. So, last question: um, What was your first technology memory as a child? First technology memory as a child, um, and it can't be TV. That's a, that's a that's a cheat answer. No, no, no. It, and it's uh, boring. So, yeah, it's 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 a split because I don't know which one came first. So. Um, I bought a ColecoVision Pong with my own money, and I would have had to have been eight years old or younger because it was it was in, in the first house we lived in. 
Uh, and I had to go through five of them to get one to work. Um, so, so there was that. that and then there was right, also, yeah. and I think, I, think, I think this one was earlier. My father came home with a computer. And it was, it was that old suitcase, looked like a handle on top, and you put it down, and you yep. flipped the keyboard out, and you had the little uh, green screen on it. And he showed me how to program something, and I uh, honestly can't remember what he showed me how to program. But a little basic, um, a little basic program or something. Was it? Was it, what were you? What was it? What was the language? Honestly, I don't even remember. Not remember. Yeah, like I mean, it, it would have had to have been. It would have had to have been early seventies, so seventy four, something somewhere around there. Um, okay. So, so stuff like that. That, that to me, that's that was the early tech. You know, the the right. Vic twenty was my first computer. That kind of thing. Um, but yeah, that that computer, the, the the fact that he was carrying it, he brought it home and put it on the on the coffee table and flipped that keyboard out. That was just so cool because it looked like a sewing machine until he set it down and took the bottom out and it had a big drive. And it was like and it, something out of from outer space at oh, that point, right? Yeah. In, in our own yeah. in our conception, right? Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Well, Bill, it's been great. Um, thank you so much for taking time and for being on Cut the Shit. We really appreciate it. Um, I hope uh, hope the move back to San Francisco goes well. And uh, hopefully maybe we can have you back on the podcast again to talk uh, at some point in the future. Yeah, I loved it. Um, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, and, you know, it's great to be back in the Bay. Terrific. Terrific. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you were enjoying the podcast, we'd appreciate it if you would become a subscriber wherever you get your podcasts. And if you could rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, that would really help us out. Or you can just go old school and tell your friends, your family, your colleagues, and hell, anybody else who you think might want to hear something like this to listen in. If you're on social media, make sure to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at CutTheShit underscore pod. We are also on TikTok, at CutTheShitPod, all one word, where we post lots of clips from the podcast. And last but not least, you can also watch the YouTube version of the show on our YouTube channel, at Plow Networks. Until next time, take care and have a great day.